Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us from all over the world uh, for this MRD talk, our second MRD talk. The objective of these dialogues uh, are to promote an exchange between science, practice, and the private sector based on recently published articles in the journal Mountain Research and Development. And these MRD talks are part of a project called Prima, which is led by UNEP and funded by the Austrian Development Agency. And the topic of our talk today is engaging with indigenous, indigenous and local knowledge for the conservation of mountain landscapes. We have uh, great panelists and uh, we really thank them for that, their time that will share with us their um, insights and their experiences. And the objective of today's talk is to jointly explore innovative conservation practices that are centered on indigenous and local knowledge. Uh, this talk is also related to uh, our new focus issue 42.4, which is entitled Weaving Together Knowledge Collaborations in Support of the Well-Being of Mountain Peoples and Regions. So I invite you to check um, online. Uh, we already have a series of very interesting papers that are published uh, in this issue. And this issue is a collaboration with the Canadian Mountain Network. And now I will briefly present the program. So we will have approximately 40 minutes of presentations. Uh, I will introduce the panelists uh, later, but we have a, an exciting program ahead. And afterwards, we will have approximately half an hour for a discussion where you will have the opportunity to ask your questions and, um, and we will engage in a, in a discussion before the wrap up. Thank you. So before we start, we have a very, very small exercise for you. We would like to invite you to click on the Mentimeter, which should appear in the chat. And uh, our question for you is, Based on your experience, what are the main challenges in engaging with indigenous and local knowledge for the conservation of mountain landscapes? So please enter simply the main challenges that come to your mind in the Mentimeter. So the link and the passwords are provided in the chat. And if you cannot access the Mentimeter, please send your answer in the chat.
Well, thank you very much. That's already extremely interesting. So we see here from your answers that uh, among the main challenges that uh, you, you encounter in engaging with indigenous and local knowledge for conservation, of course, some are linked to resources, uh, be it financial resources or capacities, but there are also a series of other challenges which are um, related to the relationship between indigenous and local communities and other actors, uh, both in terms of power relationships and I guess here the, 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 the idea is to refer to unbalanced um, power relationships, but also to difficulties in the communication, in the trust building, and in these encounters between different epistemologies and different cultures. So let's see now what we can uh, learn from our panelists. So I will first um, introduce our first panelists. I have the pleasure to introduce Mar Maria Fernandez Jimenez, who is a senior researcher and a retired professor at the Department of Forest and Rangeland Stewardship at Colorado State University in the United States. She has worked with transhuman pastoralists of the High Atlas of Morocco together with colleagues, a series of colleagues, and she will present um, us the results of their study on Ilem Shane, Transhuman Pastoralist Traditional Ecological Knowledge and Adaptive Strategies, Continuity and Change in Morocco's High Atlas Mountains. Maria, the word is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for being here and um, to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Oops. Now, unlike our, our test, my slides are not advancing. So I'm going to maybe go out and go back in. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. So our research objective was a holistic study of transhuman pastoralist traditional ecological knowledge in use. And we were guided by a relatively simple framework and set of questions that aimed to understand sustainability in pastoral and other resource systems. First, what are the dy ecological dynamics and limits of the system? Second, given those dynamics and limits, what practices maintain or enhance biodiversity and productivity? Third, what institutions, that is formal rules and laws or informal norms and customs, facilitate or enforce those sustainable practices? And fourth, how does herder traditional knowledge shape those rules and practices? And finally, what are the feedbacks between changes in practices, institutions, and the environment, and traditional knowledge. So what are the ecological dynamics of Ilumchan territory? As transhumans, Ilumchan territory encompasses a gradient from low elevation winter pastures in the Sagho Mountains, where the annual rainfall is below 200 millimeters and varies significantly between years, and high elevation summer pastures in the High Atlas Mountains, which receive about 400 millimeters of precipitation per year on average, um, but are still quite variable. And the plant communities that Ilimchan use also vary along this gradient from the steppe in the Sagho to the high mountain shrublands um, in the High Atlas. And overall, these areas support high biodiversity, but are relatively low in overall production and highly variable um, over space and between seasons and years. So we, we interviewed Ilanshan women and men about their knowledge of plants, their key practices and institutions and observations of environmental changes. And participants in these seven different group and individual interviews listed a total of 57 plant species, of which 
26 were listed by at least two different people or groups, and nine were identified as decreasing. They also shared detailed information about the ecology of these plants and their use for livestock forage. And when asked about indicators of good quality pastures, many herders spoke of Amsku, a Tashlikit word for places where sheep thrive. We also found that Ilimchan use all five adaptive strategies that many pastoralist groups use to manage risk and thrive in these highly variable environments, including diversification, which spreads risk across different asset classes like livestock species, uh, mobility, which spreads risk over space, storage, which spreads risk over time, resource sharing or pooling, which spreads risk across different households, and reciprocity or exchange, which also helps to buffer risk. Among the Ilinchan, transhumance is a key practice that enables them to take advantage of that variability across space and time. We conducted an economic study that compared transhumant and settled Ilimchan pastoral households and found that transhumance was actually more profitable than settled management. And transhumants also are able to hold larger herds, which buffers against risk and allows more flexibility to destock during droughts. Another key practice is storage via a grazing reserve or agda. Agdal Ilimchan is a um, defined area of about 2,500 hectares in the High Atlas, which is used exclusively by Ilimchan and is governed by a council um, and uh, a led by a leader that's chosen each year. The Ilimchan may use the Agdal only from about July 15th until October, and each Ilinchan family that uses the Agdal pays, helps to pay for a hired guard uh, from a different tribe to monitor use and ensure the dates are respected. And each year, a lottery is used to assign each household a campsite and grazing area within the Agdal in order that every household has an equal chance of being assigned to a place with Amsku. So that's one example of how herders uh, ecological knowledge shapes an institution like the Agda. Herders are also observing many changes in weather and pastures over the past 25 years, and these include uh, decreased levels of um, rainfall and snowfall amounts, lower water levels in springs, rivers, and lakes, and increasing rainfall intensity when it does rain. Uh, rain um, herders also uh, observe significant declines in the amount of forage, number of plants and forage quality, and increases in the amount of bare ground and erosion. So in terms of pastoral livelihoods and sustainability, these changes translate into lack of water for people and livestock, uh, insufficient pastures, and an increase in natural hazards like floods and droughts. Uh, in response, herders continue to rely um, on the Agdal for high quality summer pastures. They move longer distances and more frequently. And in some cases, although rarely, they'll purchase supplemental feed or abandon the sector altogether. Herders also discuss challenges like the lack of roads and cell phones um, in the high mountains cell phone service, which makes it very difficult to access healthcare and schooling among other services. And these are challenges that disproportionately impact women and children. So this figure um, summarizes our key findings using that initial framework. And the key takeaways are that Ilinchan knowledge of plants, climate, and plant ecology clearly shapes their practices, including transhumance and storage, as well as institutions like the Agda. Um, as climate change stresses the system, herders observe these changes and adapt using primarily their well-tested traditional practices. However, remoteness and lack of services and infrastructure and social pressures are also leading many to abandon this traditional life way and its practices. So in sum, our study suggests that Ilimchan traditional knowledge remains highly relevant for sustainable use of and life in this rugged and variable landscape. 
For example, transamance appears to be more profitable and more adaptable than settled livestock production. Yet Ilmchan face increasing challenges due to climate change, remoteness, and pressure of, to settle. We see in Ilmchan a paradox of remoteness, where that remoteness supports the maintenance of traditional knowledge and culture, which benefits land, nature, and cultural continuity. And at the same time, lack of access to infrastructure and services leads many younger Ilmchan to abandon this livelihood and life way, and that threatens the loss of associated knowledge and culture. Um, nevertheless, to end on a hopeful note, we suggest that remoteness may also create the space for more locally driven development solutions based on existing adaptive strategies. So I just want to close by um, thanking again and acknowledging my co-authors, Ahmed El Aish Osame. Osama El Aouni, Ilham Adran, and Sufian El Aidi, and acknowledging also uh, Fulbright and the Institut d'Agronomique et Vétérinaire à Sandeux for their support. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to our conversations. Thank you so much, Maria. That was uh, really interesting and inspiring. And I would like to invite now Sufian Psu who is Regional Director of the Central High Atlas Program and also the focal point for the Indigenous Community Conserved Areas for the Moroccan Biodiversity and Livelihoods Association. So, uh, Sufian works for um, a development um, and conservation organization and we asked him to reflect on the findings and the recommendations presented by Maria Fernandez and to explain how with his organization, they engage with indigenous and local knowledge in order to promote the conservation of cultural landscapes in the Moroccan High Atlas. Sufian, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you, Maria, for your presentation. I will uh, explain to to your recommendation in in my slide in the in the case study of the central atlas uh, when we talk about traditional land use practices we talk about uh, tradi traditions that sustainably sustainably use manage or maintain natural resources exist in a context of shared value attitude and ecological knowledge and are ex expected in specific livelihood strategies. When in the high atlas, when we, we, uh, we have focus on, div on diversity of cultural practices of conservation that are still maintain maintained in this area. This include, uh, include traditional water ma management, soil management, and the uh, collective land management and so social organization. And we see the example that Maria gives in his presentation is the, the Agda. Now, over our work in, uh, in the High Atlas, over to Winnie name it, cultural practices of conser conservation was were described. Uh, this cultural, co co cultural of conservation uh, are all uninterrupted uh, representing key elements of a complex uh, agroecological system. These pra uh, practices impact high atlas biodiversity in different ways, like uh, same shape, the landscape, and maintain specific topographic feeders and biodiversity patterns by dynamiting cultivation and uh, grazing areas and um, managing their water supply. Others contribute to reach uh, to the rich knowledge and use of local flora, while others facilitate the uh, abandonment of, of local value that regulate interaction among and between people and local environment. And we can see in this figure, the cultural landscape in the Atlas are structured by, by various levels, by, 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 by various levels the, of appropriation, uh, from the areas and resources uh, privately owned at the household level to do shared among uh, among families of one village and among villages of the same rural commune and among people of different rural communes.
So uh, this local ecological knowledge or local tradition, local practices is subject of change by external content and opportunities. Donc, this, uh, so the socio-economic and environmental condition in rural communities in the high Atlas are currently changing quickly and radically which, uh, significant, with significant sequences. We have here a timeline of uh, a, a, a Nagdal in the high Atlas, which we, uh, we, we see a difference of change like uh, climate change, like uh, the, the decrease of number of families that use this, these areas or uh, operation of, uh, of uh, other crops or culture. If we can uh, in, uh, in summarize this key diverse of change, we have climate change and the loss of, uh, uh, and loss of agri agricultural productivity increasing privatization and uh, individualism, changes in attitude, especially um, among the youth, which reduce willingness to work with land and livestock, uh, government agricultural uh, policies, and a massive inc increase in rural uh, uh, and urban immigration. For to support these practices and uh, traditional knowledge, uh, so a board portfolio of actions is is requested at national scale and also at individual scale. For the national scale, when when we talk about uh, uh, traditional ecological knowledge or we talk about uh, cultural practices, we talk about ACCs. So ICCA is the engineers and community concerned area of uh, which many agents. Here in Morocco, we, we work uh, actually in the in the uh, to to uh, to comment to, together in a national uh, a national network of ICCA. This national network, which has been co coordinated by by our NGO. The, the aim is to uh, the overarching aims of building this national network are, are, are to learn from each other regarding strengthening governance system and maintaining customer practices, to enhance and promote active advocacy for national recognition and support for uh, for this uh, traditional ecological knowledge and uh, this community conserved area and to co-develop strategies and plans for actions to enhance to enhance these practices in Morocco. And, I, I, and also dissemination and awareness raising for at the national and the international scale are essential for the individual level. In the, mainly in, in the agdals, more action uh, research is necessary to characterize Agdals and gain a deep understanding of the ways in which this practice is, is connected to the biodiversity and ecosystem health and continue to monitor biodiversity and to, to both contribute to a point and also to assist how socio-ecological and particularly climate changes are impacting Agdals biodiversity and resilience. Also to support for enhanced uh, livestock health and uh, management is essential if people are to, to continue using this agdan. Uh, like in the central atlas, as conflict in, in agdans uh, uh, intensify in the context of socio-ecological change, the development of adapted conflict resolution mechanism is essential also. In the, uh, in the in the in the case study of Agadal if Gordon in the Atlas Central, community members are also recommended support for the direct improvement of resources management in Agadal, including support of restored water reserve and spring in the Agadal and the for, for reforestation of key areas with not, not with native species. This also requested the building and support to encourage youth to return to the transhumanist way of life. So 
to support this, this or, or to, to respond to this, to, to this recommendation, uh, uh, our NGO and our partner, our partner Global Diversity, uh, Diversity Foundation since uh, 2000, 2012 have implemented in deep participatory actions in selected community in the high atlas on the topic of traditional land use practices and the impact on biodiversity uh, as a part of our high atlas for current and state program. This program is based on the documentation and research and partnership building, capacity building, dissemination and participatory action. And one of, of our object, uh, objective or our, our subject of this program is the docu uh, documentation and the strengthening of cultural practices. In this, in this objective, we identify and document it and we try to promote cultural practices that, ma that match and the high atlas biodiversity. And we try to understand this practice in fundamental of the collaborative development of social and ecological appropriate. And, uh, we, and we, we did a lot of work in the research then uh, documentation in uh, like uh, uh, using surveys or workshops and also disseminated dissemination of the, the, the main result of this, of, of this, of this program. So, and uh, as a part of this work, and to improve the recognition of uh, and, uh, and, and the body on community based recommendations were developed using a uh, sample interactive discussion method during the during this workshop as that's organized to identify change and diverse of, of change. And we have a list of recommendations that we developed with local communities, like increase the plantation of key species in Agdals, uh, or supporting a sustainable agricultural production, like uh, resolving conflict in, com uh, in communal to regional governance land system, and maintain our support for sustainable production and commercialization of uh, medicinal plants, uh, collaborate in the promotion of local product and tradition, and uh, and improve knowledge on agro-pastoralist livelihood and promote capacity building in various living and topics. So to try to respond to this, to this recommendation, we have de developed a community action plans. This community, uh, community action plans and roadmap for implementing community socio-environmental solution in, in, uh, in, in the, in the community, communities that we work with and collaborate uh, as a part of the Atlas Cultural Landscape Program based on a series of workshops and focus group. This action plus uh, process has identified and defined the key pil uh, pillar needs and actions for implementation in our program in the, in the next, in the next five years. The, the community action plan provide a framework for implementing the activities uh, logically and system, uh, systematically and benefit from their own monitoring and evol evaluation plan. As we see here, we have uh, uh, we have four pillars in different in different uh, uh, different uh, in different subjects like livestock governance and uh, ACCAs. Or I, I and Sorry, concern. excuse me. I, I don't know if you ah, could okay. wrap up. Um, I will finish with Even yes. though it's very interesting, but yes. we don't yes. have the time to get into the details, okay. unfortunately. Okay, but yes, and uh, 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 we have four four, four pillar in, in this action plans to respond to the community uh, best recommend recommendation. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a little bit. Uh, I'm a little bit sick. That's why. Well, thank Thanks. you so much, Sufian. Uh, that was very interesting, and congratulations for all your work.
And now I would like to invite our next panelists. And this is a study, and we have two, two co-authors here with us. We have Courtney Mason, who is professor um, at the Department of Natural Resource Science and Tourism Management of Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia, Canada. Canada, sorry. And we have Bill Snow, who is member of Good Stoney First Nations of Stoney Nakoda Nations and is acting director for Stoney Tribal Administration in Alberta, Canada. And they will present um, their study that they published in MRD, which is entitled Rethinking the Role of Indigenous Knowledge in Sustainable Mountain Development in Canada and in Aotearoa. New Zealand. Courtney, please. Shego, um, bonjour tout le monde ici. Uh, welcome everyone uh, for, for joining us on your, your busy schedules at this time of year. I'm joining from uh, the ancestral lands of Agus uh, Mohawk peoples in Eastern Ontario. And I just want to acknowledge um, our my co with the research team here, which included uh, Dr. Anna Carr, associate professor from the University of Otago in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Emily Vandermeil, uh, a master's of environmental science graduate student from Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia, uh, Bill Snow, who will introduce himself in a second uh, from Morley in Alberta, and Lois Phillip, an educator from the Northwest Territories in um, the nor northwestern part of uh, Canada. You know, really, um, uh, this project emerged from uh, a simple question that um, do does park designation matter in mountain regions? And what our team really tried to put together is a comparison uh, between uh, our national park system in, in Banff National Park, um, the a new designation of Indigenous-led uh, park creation called an Indigenous Protected and Conserved Area, and uh, the park system in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which focus on the concept of personhood status or uh, legal personality for the rights of nature. And we wanted to know uh, in basic terms whether these different park designations impacted the ways that communities, Indigenous communities, asserted their rights and also their knowledge in these spaces. And we think this is critical information for uh, those involved with land use management, um, and um, in, in protected areas, in particular in mountain spaces. I saw in our, our opening uh, exercise, you know, trust and colonial power relations were a key, featured prominently. Um, and we highlight here Alberta and uh, Banff National Park because it's uh, the first national park in Canada. And it really was the model in which our park system developed and was replicated across the country. Now, this model, um, openly facilitated um, the displacement and cultural loss for many Indigenous communities across the country. We, with the treaty uh, system, the agreements between uh, Indigenous nations and our federal government uh, facilitated uh, the creation of a reserve space. Um, and there were a number of other land use management changes, but prominently uh, the creation of our park system really uh, hindered the ways in which Indigenous communities moved on the land and their access to ancestral lands. This was accompanied by several layers of legislation that targeted Indigenous languages and cultural practices. And this all began in the context of Alberta in um, the, the 1870s and uh, continued until uh, the turn of the 20th century. I wanted to introduce the concept of an IPCA and uh, what its main criteria are. And that is, uh, it's a new Indigenous-led uh, park designation in Canada that um, is led by Indigenous peoples and Indigenous governments. It's committed to long-term conservation goals, and it elevates the rights of Indigenous peoples and responsibilities on the land. I also wanted to highlight where this came from. It really began uh, in 2010 with the United Nations uh, Convention on Biodiversity, where um, globally it was recognized that biodiversity is a pressing issue, and they asked nation states to develop their own domestic targets. These are called often in nation states HE targets. In Canada, that took five years, very slow um, kind of plan, but that recognized that um, by 2020, 
They wanted to protect 17% of terrestrial areas and in inland waters, 10% of marine areas in a network of protected areas. And um, that's okay if you live in a small nation state, um, but in Canada of almost 10 million square kilometers, that's a huge amount of land that needed to be um, changed the way its land use management worked. The government also had a number of other objectives, which meant uh, reconciling these problematic histories that are referred to at the beginning of the lecture uh, between government levels of government and Indigenous nations and also supporting UNDRIP or the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Principles, um, which was a, you know, a, global, a global movement. The federal government of Canada has doubled down since then, recognizing 25% by 2025 and 30% by 2030. Uh, and the main way that they're gonna facilitate this is through this indigenous led park designation. I should also recognize that it's not just about biodiversity, but also climate resilience. Carbon sequestration is a key aspect of these new designations. And they want to, of course, do this without jeopardizing, um, you know, food, indigenous food systems. The first uh, IPCA, uh, which a um, couple of people on our research team were involved with, is called EDG, and it's in the Northwest Territories. It's not a small area, over 14,000 square kilometers. Um, and it, it really protects the, the Dene uh, culture, language, and ways of life, and had key uh, conservation space to protect uh, caribou, a woodland bison, and several species of migratory birds. And this was the first of several that would follow. There are now five in Canada and 27 active applications uh, throughout the country for an IPCA. I want to move on to the, the third aspect, and that is uh, what, what is occurring in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And this is the concept of legal personality. This is the idea that an ecological resource uh, can receive the responsibilities and legal rights of a human being. And uh, this is part of the global rights to nature movements that, um, that are happening in many nation states. Uh, but in New Zealand, it's quite a, it takes a, a unique uh, perspective on that, and uh, several ecological resources, including the Funganui River uh, and um, Te Arawera or Arawera, which is a national park in the North Island of New Zealand, have received this status. And has two. Uh, the legislation has two key points. It really new, new, neutralizes the debate over ownership of land. It's not owned by the crown or the federal government. It's not owned by indigenous or, in this case, Maori communities. It's it's owns itself and. It also adds a number of layers in environmental legal protection. Tongariro National Park and Edgemont National Park, both on the North Island of New Zealand, have already received this uh, protection. And there are several national parks in the South Island of New Zealand that are considering, considering this legal uh, perspective as well. To summarize, um, you know, I think it's important um, that, you know, as, as our participants have already highlighted, uh, to recognize uh, why colonial histories of cultural repression and violence really shape um, their relationships today and, and are, are a huge barrier uh, to building trust and community relations. IPCAs um, certainly have a great deal of potential. Um, they, they can navigate political corridors. They can uh, really um, use a park protection designation to betterment indigenous livelihoods and, and local mountain ecosystems. They can foster what I believe is the next generation of, um, of conservation objectives that are indigenous led. But we have to remember the wrongs of the past are the wrongs of the present too, as this dialogue is happening today. Globally, there are many indigenous communities um, who are having their lands, uh, are being displaced by their lands under the guise of conservation. And so to, um, to put forward any park designation without proper consultation, without it being indigenous led, really could has the potential of reifying the colonial power structures that I identified at the beginning. Lastly, uh, all uh, nation states and all um, mountain uh, regions need to look broader than their own borders for to understand um, how indigenous communities are exercising uh, these rights in different uh, locations in the world, what is working, uh, what are major barriers, and work together to, um, to emphasize the importance of Indigenous-led conservation, and I would say particularly important in sensitive mountain ecosystems. 
I have a number of uh, recommendations that are, are profiled by our co-authors in, in the paper, but I wanted to uh, just uh, emphasize how important the consultation process is and that Indigenous um, governments and leadership lead these processes. I also want to recognize that Indigenous tourism in many where appropriate can be a, a great way uh, forward, particularly if um, if it's indigenous led and owned and operated tourism businesses or, or they have um, prop the proper stakeholders in place. And also in Canada, at least in Canada and throughout New Zealand, a lot of these um, tourism infrastructure development is uh, in response to uh, alternative economies uh, against the natural resource development sector, which uh, interestingly for our presentation today also includes in Canada, agrarian uh, systems and ranching, older ranching systems that have become threats to those ecosystems. And um, the, the, I think, you know, these kinds of stakeholder development um, really have a, a lot of uh, potential moving forward. In addition to my co-authors, uh, co we have to, of course, recognize the communities that made this research possible, um, archival and photo credits, especially the Canadian Mountain Network as a, as a critical uh, funder for our group. And of course, uh, the support and invitation from the Mountain Research and Development Team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Courtney. And uh, I will invite now Bill, who will complement also your, your presentation. Ambua Stitch, good day. Great. Uh, Ambua Stitch, good day. Uh, my name is Bill Snow. I'm the uh, uh, consultation uh, acting director of consultation for Stony Tribal Administration. Uh, I'm here in uh, Winchispa or Yade, otherwise known as Calgary, Alberta, Canada, in uh, Treaty 7 territory. Uh, thank you to all the organizers, Courtney, and our our guests, and and everyone watching. And I hope this is a, a good open uh, learning space for everyone. Uh, the reintroduction began in uh, the Bison reintroduction to Banff National Park. Uh, really began in about 2016 with a. Uh, uh, federal uh, environmental assessment that took that began and uh, we had uh, looked at that environmental assessment and had discovered that the uh, assessment did not have a cultural component uh, bison or tatanga are uh, culturally important species uh, Banff National Park Menerpe, Menerpa Makoche is also a very culturally important landscape. Uh, mountains, the source of all of our waters, uh, source of a lot of our medicines, uh, harvesting areas, uh, places where we go to hunt, gather, uh, and travel to meet our relatives and, and to meet with other groups. So very important landscape and it was a big missing piece and we had advocated for uh, capacity and resources to conduct the study, which we were successful in, in compelling that study in 2019 through the Canadian Mountain Network. Uh, this is a map of the uh, part of the uh, project area uh, that we were, that where we conducted our study in, in 2020, uh, parts of our field work. Uh, we were able to monitor the bison herd uh, during one week of uh, field work. Uh, this is a very remote area. The whole reintroduction zone is about 1,200 square kilometers. So it's a large area within Bath National Park. And uh, 16 head of bison were released uh, from Elk Island National Park into uh, Bath National Park in, in 2016. Today, that herd is over 90, 90 head of bison that are roaming in a very um, uh, non-populated area of uh, Banff National Park. Very, again, very important, uh, culturally important landscape where our, we had three riders, 
uh, one from each of the stony bands, the Bear Spot, Chiniki, and Wesley, or uh, good stony bands, as they are now known, uh, rode in with Park's personnel to go and see where uh, bison had been foraging and moving around since 2016. Uh, this map is in the, the report that we completed earlier this year in, uh, in April of this year. The, uh, the bison cultural study is important because it offers us a way to look at bison, not just from Western science, but, in, but from traditional knowledge. When we have that understanding and we have that knowledge, we should be acting on it. We should be implementing on it, implementing, uh, uh, act, do, doing the actions that we need to do to preserve traditional knowledge as it relates to bison and these landscapes. This is an important aspect of that colonial settler indigenous uh, group relationship to repair, repair those oppressive relationships and to build on reconciliation efforts. We are not just talking about studies and doing great, beautiful, nice studies, but we should be implementing those actions that we need to see, the changes that we need to see on landscapes that are largely based on Western science. This study has been really important to our community, to the individuals that have taken place, to our elders, and to the youth. Uh, we maintain a bison herd uh, in our on our reserve at uh, Stony Nakoda. Uh, the herd that we have, we've maintained it since 1970. Part of the process for this study was to do uh, take part in the bison harvests that we've been doing uh, about every two years. Uh, this particular in in this earlier this year in January, we we're able to bring in students from each of uh, the three reserves uh, from our community, uh, the Bighorn, Morley, and Eden Valley communities, bringing community elders and youth together to take part in these harvests, doing the ceremonies, uh, bringing youth to take part in, so that they understand the importance of bison uh, historically but currently. They can see that connection, that understanding that we still maintain uh, for these great, beautiful, uh, majestic animals. It's a way of reconnecting our people, not only to their culture, but to their uh, traditional lands. When we have uh, riders and participants who are able to go to these uh, places that are not widely accessible, it, it really speaks to our reconnections around community wellness, individual wellness, reconnecting us to landscapes and our relationship with these lands and, and this wildlife. Uh, really important looking forward as well. Uh, some of the, uh, we have 11 recommendations in our report and we want to learn more about the, the herd's behavior. We want the reintroduction to continue. It's only a pilot, uh, project at this stage. We want that uh, pilot to continue for another uh, period of time. We want to learn more about those herd dynamics, how they move around, changes that they're implementing to grasses, wild, wildflowers, keeping soils biodiverse, keeping willows biodiverse, uh, maintaining forest controls in a very important area. That's one thing that's been coming up, especially in Canada and many other places around the world, the, the outgrowth of uh, forest fires. Uh, when we remove wild, important wildlife species from, from landscapes, we have a lot of uh, areas that are now under out of control in, in extended fire seasons. So there's a lot that bison bring to landscapes that we don't understand yet and that we hope to in the future. Ishnish, thank you. Thank you so much, Bill and Courtney. And um, that was a uh, very, very important, not only to see the result from your study, but also to see this uh, very concrete case of bison reintroduction and the importance of indigenous knowledge in it. And now I would like to invite our last panelists, Penina Zaninka, who is coordinator 
for the United Organization for Batwa Development in Uganda. She's an Indigenous uh, rights act activist and she received the 2021 Human Rights Defender of the Year Award in Uganda. So we ask Penina to reflect on the findings and on the recommendations by, uh, presented by Courtney and Bill and to reflect about their relevance in the context of Uganda and specifically of the case of the Batwa people of Mbwindi and Gaginga National Parks. Penina, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah and the team the organizers and uh, the public who is listening to me. Good, uh, good evening, this is Ugandan time. Uh, I am happy to present the, the issues as required by uh, Sarah and the team, and it goes like this. Uh, we are going to share on the engaging uh, with the indigenous peoples and local knowledge for the conservation of mountain uh, landscape. And the picture, hi, hi Sarah, I hope you are showing up the presentation for the public to see or for the-, for the Yes, other we are. We, we are sharing you so your much. presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, the picture you are seeing is the picture of the Batwa people the Batwa indigenous uh, peoples in Uganda, and mainly uh, here they were in, in having the capacity building for the fighting of their rights. Um, now, who is uh, Wobdu? Wobdu is in short, the United Organization for Batwa Development in Uganda, mm -hmm. and this was formed in 2000 by the by the Batwa indigenous themselves with the aim of addressing the land problem and help them have sustainable alternative livelihood as you would see it be uh, below there is the eviction issue you may you may follow the slides but down you will get to understand what i mean with with the aim of sustainable alternative livelihood uh, who, uh, who is then wobdu and its mission the WOPDU's mission is to have a Batwa community that is dignified, empowered, educated, and recognized. Penina? To promote the rights and... Yes? Yes, we couldn't hear you. We heard the vision and... Oh, uh, sorry, sorry. The, I, well, We lost you again. The, the we, oh, sorry. The mission is. Are you getting in now? Yes. The mission is to promote the rights and build the capacity of the Batwa indigenous peoples through formal and informal education, skills development, livelihood support, healthy programs, and advocate for the promotion and protection of their human rights. Um, was formerly they were hunter gatherers that were that inhabited in the forests of Windy, Mugahinga, and the Chuya forest for time immemorial. Then, uh, in 1991, these uh indigenous peoples were evicted from their motherland by the government of Uganda for the creation of the national park, mainly the Bwind and Mugahinga forest, which were meant into the, uh, the national, uh, the Penina? of keeping uh, Hello? Yes, now we can hear you. I don't know if you are, you are sometimes on mute, but now we can hear you. Uh, no, the net, as the network was off, I'm completely off. Uh, I'm saying that the, uh, in 1991, the, for the community, these indigenous peoples were evicted from their mother and the Mugahinga and the Bwindi for the purposes 
of the creation of national parks by the government of Uganda. Uh, then uh, the, by the time they were evicted, they were left with no nothing completely. There was no compensation. They was they got scattered and got uh, faced the challenge of landlessness and uh, as a squatters on other people's land. Uh, this batwa currently the way uh, I mean the the indigenous peoples I'm talking about in Uganda are about six thousand six thousand two hundred. And 50 of them are living as landless people because even the 50%, they are living on other people's land, others on the land that was purchased by different, I mean, different donors under uh, different NGOs. But the challenge is there is no land ownership. However much 50% are living on, on the land that was purchased by different NGOs with the donor money, there is no land ownership. So they are more like they are still living as squatters. So the current uh, challenge uh, of, and, and the situation of the Batwa we are talking about, these indigenous peoples have got limited education because of poverty, and they are also high, uh, highly discriminated and marginalized by the neighboring communities. They also uh, have a challenge of poor standards of living because of high poverty levels. And on the issue of violations, they have a lot of challenges as a community which, who was evicted from their motherland. Now, if I look at when when we, when I looked at the um, the research that was done by Courtney Mansion and Bill Snow, uh, comparing to the situation of the Batwa indigenous peoples, uh, more or less they are so much of similar situation. Apart from like the those that uh, uh, the research came up with, those are more like. Uh, I would do. I would do. Categorize them as fishermongers, well as these are hunter gatherers. The indigenous peoples from here are indigenous people. Are rather are hunter gatherers. Were hunter gatherers. One. If you look at the 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 research that was done by Mansion and Bill Snow, uh, you will see that uh, here I will compare it that these the indigenous peoples as Batwa they were forcefully evicted that had no free prior informed consent. And uh, uh, on, if I look at their rights, their rights continue to be violated. If I look at the violations, there are also a lot of violations within and from the research side. Then uh, if I look at what is the law of the Batwa now, the law of the Batwa in conservation here in Uganda, in southwestern Uganda, it's not valued and considered at all because one, they are living outside the forest. They are not, they are not considered as, as people who would use the traditional knowledge to manage these forests. Uh, yet, with the traditional knowledge of the indigenous peoples, they would be given uh, some, some kind of employment, they would be given some kind of um, opportunities to also be part of the managers to have decision making on their ancestral land. Then um, there is also enhancement, enhanced sustainable and low impact as indigenous tourism opportunities. The, uh, uh, there is also land from existing indigenous led park management frameworks in a new protected areas designation and community conserved areas. Uh, we also look at invest in long term indigenous and non indigenous alliances to navigate political corridors and improve mountain ecosystems and the livelihoods of the local people. And uh, I think uh, finally, my last slide, I, uh, when, I, uh, when we look at engagement with Batwa indigenous peoples for conservation, we look at community sensitizations and capacity building. We, look our, we also look at uh, having access, the community should have access to their ancestral land and also access to worshiping sites within the forest. 
uh, the legal representation and also mapping of their territories. Uh, the culture preservant, uh, preservation through music, dance and drama, and also trails, the Batwa trails and documentation of their traditional knowledge. Uh, last but not least, domestication of medicinal herbs and other weaving materials and other traditional knowledge uh, because these uh, people do not have any access to these medicinal herbs, however much they would visit the hospitals and they are charged with some money in some clinics, government, government hospitals. At times they find the medicine and they get it free of charge. But when there is a, a limited medication, the Batwa suffer a lot because they do not have income to cater for the medicine outside there in pharmacies and clinics and private hospitals. So we need to have med, uh, domestications of these medicinal herbs and weaving materials and also some traditional knowledge for their uh, children uh, and onwards. Then finally, we need to improve on positive collaborations with the local government and park managers to have better relationship and also some recognition of their traditional knowledge as people who, who, are, uh, who are the owners of this ancestral land. Thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to have some questions after. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penina. That was, um, and thank you for all your your work and your commitment in this, uh, as we can see, very very difficult uh, situation for the Batwa people in Uganda. Now, I would like you to to invite all of you, all the participants, also to uh, write any question you may have for any of the panelists in the chat or any comments. And when you do so, please mention to whom your question is addressed. I uh, will already start with a first uh, question by Jersey Maslanka to Courtney and, and Bill. And they ask specifically, how do you define what is the meaning of indigenous tourism? And also, what does that mean that Indigenous tourism is led or should be led by Indigenous people. Bill, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think, uh, uh, well, um, maybe uh, Courtney can add on to Indigenous tourism, uh, but I think that uh, what we're, what we have seen uh, in in colonial structures, we see a a uh, imbalance of power and an imbalance of economic opportunity uh, in in historically in in tourism. Uh, we have uh, a very Western view of how how landscapes are uh, understood, how wildlife is understood, and then uh, you know we might have some indigenous inclusion. Uh, in in that sort of uh, scenario, uh, what we don't have is the 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 true or the the uh, understanding that uh, indigenous groups have their their names for those landscapes and places, their names for those uh, species of wildlife, and their the importance of those wildlife and those landscapes. Um, you know, travel throughout the Canadian Rockies and you'll see uh, mountain names from people, from settler people names all over the place, much like uh, many other parts of the world. We don't really see or understand the the indigenous uh, aspect of these places. Uh, in some places that's changing uh, in Canada where we have uh, more groups uh, willing to share their traditional knowledge place names and uh, understanding of of wildlife but um, it's not we're not in the place where we want to be uh courtney i'm not sure if you want to add more to that well thank you for the question and and also uh for, for bill's response um you know bill alluded to the the aspect of tourism it, you know tourism is is very much um, part of the problematic colonial histories that we refer to, 
tourism was one of the main uh, key objectives of creating and extending our park system across the country in Canada, and I would say also in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But I also have a lot of hope uh, for Indigenous-led uh, processes, as the WTO defines Indigenous tourism as like Indigenous-led uh, and owned and operated um, infrastructure. And I have a lot of hope for those um, processes in Western Canada, partly because um, tourism has a great uh, potential to bring to be people together. It's a it's a it's an educational opportunity for non-Indigenous peoples and a, a critical meeting space for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And when those representations are are controlled by Indigenous people, and when those um, infrastructure is controlled by Indigenous peoples, it has um many it can achieve many objectives including um you know offering employment in places where traditionally the natural resource extraction industries were uh were uh foundational in those economies so in places in rural canada and in insensitive mountain ecosystems this may be uh, a productive way forward thank you very much I see that Jersey has the hands up. I don't know if you wanted to respond or you, you had an additional question related to that topic. Please go, you can ask directly, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jersey Maslanka. I live uh, in uh, Misty Valley, uh, Alberta. This is, uh, uh, my place is located not far from the Stony Nakoda, one of the Stony Nakoda uh, Bighorn Reservation was, always uh, other reservation Cree, First Nation. And my question is related to, uh, and I would like to ask both of you, uh, Bill and uh, Courtney, what uh, avenues you took and in order to, uh, to have a discussion with the other First Nation, as, as we know, uh, Stony Nakoda is not the only First Nation that, uh, that was using uh, and, 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 and come to this territory. So uh, I would like to uh, see and learn, uh, you know, uh, if you collaborated with other First Nation on the issue of uh, indigenous tour tourism and how you are, uh, what uh, avenue and procedures you took to collaborate with non-indigenous uh, uh, people like myself, uh, uh, so that would be very interesting to hear because I myself uh, uh, running a, a tour company and I'm very familiar with uh, with the history of the First Nation and I include uh, in my tours uh, and I talk a lot about uh, the history of the First Nation and, and myself, I have a very friend, many, many friends uh, on the reservation. So how we are, how you are involving uh, other First Nation and no First Nation people into your uh, agenda. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> um, well, the the study that we undertook, uh, the Bison Cultural Study, that was uh, primarily for the Stony Nakoda. So the three the three bands that comprise the Stony Nakoda that are the the Bear Spa, Chiniki, and the Wesley, that is now the Good Stony, Good Stony First Nation. Uh, so that was the scope of our study. And we we looked at uh, the cultural aspects of reintroducing bison uh, into the Banff National Park. Uh, there were undertones, I think, of tourism uh, in, in previous uh, uh, Banff, uh, bison reintroductions to Banff National Park uh, that were problematic. Uh, the placement of where the, the bison uh, uh, were situated uh, prior to uh, in and around the uh, 1940s and 1950s uh, was acting as a, a barrier to uh, elk and deer movement uh, through the uh, Banff uh, town area. Uh, so that was all taken out. The, the the bison paddock that was set up there at the base of uh, uh, Cascade Mountain. Uh, the current uh, reintroduction zone, uh, that was uh, part of the uh, process that Parks Canada went through 
to to reintroduce bison into that area, uh, namely because there there were not a lot of people. Um, and 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 I think also for our study, uh, we were um, Courtney, if you want to uh, touch on it, but we were really looking at whether or not uh, uh, traditional knowledge aspects and do they matter in 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 the larger in the larger context of uh, uh, tourism. And I think they do, because uh, if we're just doing the same old business as usual, uh, relying on Western science for our understanding and implementation, uh, then uh, we're gonna get those same results. Uh, we're seeing overgrowth of uh, different types, uh, uh, overgrowth of um, uh, forested areas being, being uh, uh, fire hazards now in the parks because of the no no fire no burn policy we removed a lot of wildlife out of the national parks and other areas due to hunting and, and other activities reintroducing these uh, 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 reintroducing these very uh, keystone species back to their their uh, native lands their traditional areas and doing it with ceremony uh, when we had the reintroduction, the bison blessing ceremony at Elk Island National Park. Uh, we had a, a teepee set up for the Treaty 6 First Nations to come and do a ceremony. And then we had a, a teepee set up for the Treaty 7 First Nations to do a ceremony. And that's all uh, documented in, in our report, the cultural study. Nobody would have ever known that because that cultural aspect is not in the environmental assessment. Mm -hmm. And that only came about because when uh, we were able to uh, work with parks to conduct those cer the ceremony that we did at Elk Island, that's the first one that was ever done on in uh, Elk Island National Park in its over 100 year history. So starting those ceremonies in 2017, continuing on to do ceremonies in Bath National Park. Uh, I can only speak for Stony Nakoda and that and the ceremonies and the elders that we worked with. Uh, the other bands uh, I can't control or I can't speak to their interests or or their um, uh, what their what their uh, involvement would be. Um, my because I'm Stony Nakoda, I would I can only work with the elders and the youth and and the communities for Stony Nakoda. Uh, Courtney. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Bill, for that response, and thank you for the question. Just very briefly to save time for the other panelists and other questions, uh, just, you know, that was an excellent response about the contemporary context, and also acknowledge that, um, as the, as the uh, participant probably knows, is, you know, there's long-standing, you know, Banff, the Bow Valley was a, a critical uh, gathering place for, for uh, Indigenous groups long before Europeans arrived. In Western Canada, and that is reflected in much of the early Indigenous tourism economies that that existed there, particularly in the 20th century. And so, there's long-standing relationships uh, and collaborations within the tourism economies that I think are are being extended today under some of these conservation uh, practices. Thank you very much, both Bill and Corney, for your answers. I, I noticed that there is a question to Maria Fernandez, but before that, I will um, convey another question, which is related to Indigenous tourism by Jessica um, Srite. So do you think that Indigenous tourism creates the danger of commercializing Indigenous culture and practices, similar to the mistreatment of Sherpas in Nepal, for example. And um, that question is for um, uh, Corne Bill or Penina, but I suggest to give uh, the word to Penina. So maybe in the context of Uganda, do you think that is there first Indigenous tourism and do you think that it creates a danger of commercialization of Indigenous culture? Penina, I don't know if you're still with us. You're yes. muted. Yes, uh, we can hear you now. Come again with the question, please. Yes. So in the case of Uganda, do you think that indigenous tourism creates the danger of commercializing indigenous culture and practices? Uh, uh, not really. The... the 
tourism, as long as the indigenous peoples in Uganda, the Batwa indigenous peoples are recognized, uh, recognize, being recognized with their traditional knowledge and involvement, not simply to use as, uh, to answer your question, they may, be, it, it may create danger because uh, that is when they are not recognized, they are more like being used. But if they are respected, and be part of the management. They get to know what is in and what is out. Then they, they are, their culture is being respected. I don't think that, that it could be any danger in that. But mm -hmm. if they are being but if they are being used, if, they are, if their rights are not respected, if their views are not taken into consideration as, as, as the indigenous community that, that really uh, has, have the knowledge. You see, when you mix science and traditional knowledge, the results comes out very well. But if you look at only science and you live behind the culture, the, the, the people's culture, there you are losing. So I, I would say that uh, tourism as tourism may not be all that danger because once the people are respected, they will do the preservation of their, their culture and their knowledge. But if they are not respected, like for example here, uh, if they don't have, if they are recognized and, and people who are coming in for the tourism, for example, this is just an example to learn from. Uh, to learn from you, you people would go into people's privacy for example these are the people that are living in poverty in high poverty maybe the doors are not there to their bedrooms and if they are being recognized as to, uh, as in a tourism in a tourism project the indigenous people's culture is recognized there wouldn't be any any harm or any danger but if they are not recognized their rights are not recognized and respected and their culture being preserved and promoted then that one you would definitely get nothing out of the tourism it's instead of instead of supporting the indigenous peoples it becomes it, it it creates harmful to that thank you Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Very important um, contribution. I, we will take one last question. Uh, we could go for a long time, of course, with this interesting discussion, but we would like, we'll take one last question, which is to Maria Fernandez by Isabel Hag. Uh, how did you assess communities' perceptions of climate change? And did you also identify potential factors? Oh, dear. So Saralan has cut out. Can everybody still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks, okay. Maria. Um, I will go ahead and answer the question. I can see it in the um, chat as well. So um, we assessed uh, herders' observations of climate change using a, a combination of a structured uh, survey uh, similar to ones that we've used with other pastoral communities in other parts of the world, and then more open-ended um, kinds of discussion and uh, their qualitative um, comments. So it was, a, it was a combination, but we start with kind of a structured survey asking them about their observations of change over a specific time period. So we focus on people who are of an age that they have a memory of the um, beginning of that time period. We go back about 25 years. And in terms of other potential factors influencing um, those observations, uh, the only thing that we were we recorded were age and gender, but uh, almost all the people we talked to were um, pastoralists, and and most of them transhumant pastoralists by by profession. And they are um, I won't say they have no access to media, but their access is pretty limited, especially during the months when they're in the high mountains and. Uh, uh, women in particular tend to be monolingual, speaking only Tashilhit. Uh, and I don't know if there are uh, Tashilhit radio or television stations. So it, it's possible that um, they're influenced by that broader discourse on, on climate change. Um, 
but we did not uh, look into that specifically. Thank you very much, Maria. And um, I will. I know that there are there could be many other questions and comments, but we would like now um, also to reflect. We have a very small exercise again for you. If you could click on the link in the chat of the Mentimeter, and the question we would like to reflect all of you participants is: What are your take-home messages on engaging with indigenous and local knowledge for the conservation of mountain landscapes? And thinking specifically about what we jointly learned and exchanged in this event. So thank you very much. We can see that, uh, of course, the question of being Indigenous-led and what, do that, what does that mean? Uh, so participation in decision-making and, um, and uh, over the decisions, over the management of that land is fundamental. But also the question here again, as in the beginning of our discussion, the question of the relationships that can be engaged between different actors and indigenous peoples, local communities and other actors and the respect needed. I think I'm happy to see um, the word encouraging. We heard about some situations which are very difficult, but also with about some promising examples and, and new developments in, in conservation practices. So if I um, try to wrap up, uh, the very difficult task of wrapping up all these, the wealth of, of, um, of information and insights we got from this talk. I think that we saw some very different situations around the world. Um, for instance, in the case of Canada and Aotearoa, um, despite, of course, a lot of challenges and uh, colonial histories, there are some promising new development and new designations. Uh, one of them was these indigenous conserved protected areas. Uh, sorry, and, and then also in, uh, in our area, even the, 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 the rights that are recognized to nature and what that can mean for a territory. Uh, on the other extreme, we have the case of Uganda, where the Batwa people are not recognized at all. Their basic rights are not recognized and that end up being landless due to this conservation efforts uh, they're, and subject to violence. And their role in conservation is not yet uh, recognized. So a long, there is a long way there in, in Uganda to support the indigenous peoples. And fortunately, some um, organizations such as Peninas are, are working for that. Uh, in the case of the High Atlas of Morocco, we have a different case where we can see how indigenous knowledge and uh, local communities can contribute to conservation, not in strictly protected areas, but in cultural landscapes, understanding um, through their traditional ecological knowledge, but also through their institutions and lifestyles. And we also saw how this was an extremely important resource for future adaptation. But we also saw some of the challenges that these knowledge and lifestyles are facing at the moment. 
um, maybe one uh, some of the um, dimensions that I think are common to all these different cases and situations is uh, first of all the the crucial importance of the recognition of indigenous and um, local people's rights to land and it, this means access to land but also mechanisms to give them uh, power power and participation into the management on the management of these resources a second dimension which was highlighted uh, also in uh, in um, in Canada and with the case of indigenous tourism, but also um, in the High Atlas of Morocco with the case of medicinal plants and other activities, is important of developing sustainable economic activities that can actually also benefit these indigenous peoples in and support them in continuing to conserve and manage their lands. And then a third. A uh, very important dimension is the aspect of recognition of the recognition of the whole culture, which includes not only the values but also the epistemologies and the, the, the worldviews, and specifically traditional ecological knowledge and how this, for instance, should be integrated into science. And that science alone is not sufficient and cannot. Um, bring the answers that we need to conserve these landscapes also for ethical reasons and for the and 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 um considering the need for reconciling these often um dramatic colonial histories so i thank you so much all of you for this very interesting talk um we will all the key insights from this talk but also all the resources so the link to the papers to some of the work of our panelists uh, all of this material will be shortly updated on our website and we will inform you when this is um, done so um we also hope very much that you will be able to participate in our next uh, talk MRD3. We will pre announce it towards the end of March, beginning of April. So the topic is still a surprise. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation and in particular our panelists.